Welcome to Journey Through Sci-Fi. My name is Matt. And my name is James. This is our 12th episode in our AI series. And last week we were talking about synchronization and the friction that that can cause between humans and AI. And this week we're looking at what happens when that friction turns into outright hostility. It's a hostile takeover episode. Yes, it is. Can you believe we've done 12 episodes? Yeah, I know. It's exciting. We've actually done more than that, you know. We've done the We've intro. had a few bonuses. Yeah, definitely. So it's been, it's been good. It's been good so far. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning more about artificial intelligence as we go on. Yeah, I'm learning a lot. I'm watching a lot of films. That's always a good thing. Like Matt said, today's episode is going to be about hostile takeovers. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a couple of British sci-fi films today. So we're going to be looking at The Machine from 2013, and we're also going to be taking a look at Kill Command from 2016. They're very British sci-fi films. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? They've yeah. Got a... <laughs> They're very British. They're very independent. Yeah. Very, yeah. very indie, both of them. Definitely. So shall we get straight into it? Yeah. Um, shall we start with The Machine? Absolutely. <laughs> There are a lot of secrets down here in the dark. You make weapons for the government? No. I make intelligent machines. So The Machine by Caradog W. James. Am I saying that right, Caradog? Yeah, I had a little look online beforehand just to check pronunciation, and I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. That's it's a, a lovely, Welsh name, lovely isn't it? Welsh name, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's um, it's a Welsh-backed sci-fi film, isn't it? Welsh government-backed. Yeah, Welsh Did government-backed. You see, that was co-funded by the Welsh Assembly. Fantastic. Yeah, love that. Proper homespun British science fiction. Piece. Yeah, because that's the thing. Because um, British sci-fi was such a big thing throughout the fifties. And they sort of followed on from America's lead. And there were lots of big studios back then. There was Ealing Studios. Hammer put out um, lots of sci-fi films throughout the 50s. Uh, I watched um, uh, Quatermass. Oh, nice. I've never seen that. Yeah. So there was like, um, they they created this Doctor character. And there's a few different uh, installments of the Quatermass series. So I watched... um, Quatermass 2 the other day. Is he Dr. Quatermass? Is yeah. That? Right, okay. Yeah, so Quatermass 2 was put out by Hammer, and then um, obviously they went on to put all out, put out so many great horror films. Also, Ealing Studios were putting out lots of um, great films at the time, sort of throughout the 50s. Things like Day of the Triffids, if you've ever was seen that, that one. I don't know, I'm not sure if that was actually Ealing. Um, the Man in the White Suit was the one that, the, that they did in Ealing Studios. What's that? That was a really early sci-fi um, sort of 50s but yeah sort of like day of the triffids came out um in the 60s village of the damned all these sort of like great british sci-fi stories were being made i feel like there haven't been that many recent british sci-fi flicks i know there was um 28 days later was a big one that's a that's a classic yeah absolute classic a modern classic yeah when you think of sci-fi do you think of many british directors automatically no i don't but you mentioning 28 days later obviously danny boyle one of my favorite directors uh he also made sunshine yeah but do you really think of that as a british film yeah because it's got an american cast it's mostly americans it? in the cast yeah. isn't it um see is that difference between because this feels like a british film the machine but obviously you, you think of Stanley Kubrick, he was a British director as well, but you don't think of his films as being British. Yeah, like with most of our best TV and film talent, it gets exported to America um, and then becomes part of the American industry. Uh, Black Mirrors, some of the best modern British sci-fi, which has also been exported and is now broadly American sci-fi, but it's still from that British heritage, isn't it? Yeah, so we're saying the Brits have good sci-fi ideas we have the best sci-fi, sci-fi ideas hg wells was a brit wasn't he? obviously one of the foremost early science fiction writers mary shelley she was british we've talked about frankenstein yep. kicking off the genre yeah exactly so mary shelley basically created science fiction in this here country yeah in this here country so yes yeah, so the machine we've established it's a british independent film uh what did you think of it first off i really liked it um 
both of these films, I'll, I'll just say I liked them both. Uh, and both of these films really reminded me of Automata and Upgrade in the sense that they they have quite a small budget. They do quite a lot with very little. These two films especially do a great deal with very little vi- visible budget. Yeah. So I think it, I think both of them had about a million dollars. That's nothing. nothing. Nothing for a film. Yeah. And they managed to put these films together. Yeah. And yeah, I really like both of these. I like them for different reasons. But yeah, I think they're very well put together for independent films. Mm. They remind me of um, Monsters. Yes, Monsters. And Monsters was a British film as well. It was a British film. And in particular, I think that film was made off the back of a competition. I think the director made a short film for a sci-fi competition, which I've entered actually. And when you watch those films that are made for those competitions on, you know, zero budget and in incredibly tight circumstances, you see the filmmakers working around problems to make something interesting out of nothing. Um, And that's what you see in both of these films. Definitely in set design in both of the films and the choice of locations, the machine primarily takes place in an underground facility, bunker type thing, uh, with very limited requirements for the set there's lots of shots that are just in big empty hangers right yeah uh but it works perfectly because they've designed a plot that functions well within that underground sparse facility environment it's a really believable setting isn't it yeah so so what's what's the plot of the machine so it's set during a cold war with china yep isn't it and the thing that's sort of propelling this war is whoever can come up with artificial intelligence first will sort of gain the advantage. There's been a focus on both sides to improve robotics to to win that inevitable heating up of the Cold War, I think, was what I took from it. Yeah, and this seems very sort of um, topical for now because uh, Putin has very uh, famously said that the first country to get hold of artificial intelligence will or have the most power has he yeah Mm -hmm. so that's scary when you put it in those contexts yeah it's very it's very modern um the the choice of china is interesting the economic tension between the west and china at the moment um makes them an an interesting choice for this although communist china sort of looming over the west has been a bit of a trope in cinema for, for decades really hasn't it certainly since the end of the last cold war yeah definitely and the fact they've used like a cold war setting again it's and it's such a science fiction thing like you've said it's it's part it's ingrained into so many sci-fi films and to sort of um dredge it back up for this yet put it in a modern day setting yeah i think it works well it's a modern spin on a a familiar classic sci-fi trope isn't it um so in terms of the plot the plot is actually fairly complicated there's a lot of twists and turns to it a lot of nooks and crannies and one of the failings because i don't think either of these films are perfect by any yeah. stretch uh one of the failings is there's there's an awful lot going on in this film at once isn't there yeah. and yeah. it's it's under an hour and a half it's like an hour and 20 something um and it's unbelievable that they've tried to squeeze so much plot into it yeah it's a lot of um a lot of different plot stuff a lot of different philosophical things they're trying to get through um and i think that is one of the um things that a lot of critics said about it uh, I think it, it has had a lot of really strong reviews, but I think some of the um, some of the critics pointed out that it's trying to do a lot in a short amount of time. Yeah. And obviously with a small budget. Yeah, and it was picked up for a while, but I think it fell through. It was picked up for a TV series by the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, and I think it's a rare example of where a film, you know, might work quite well extended out into a series. It's got a lot of stuff that, that Westworld is doing Mm. uh certainly in in the first season of Westworld and you can see how that would work some of the subplot the main subplot in this film would work quite well spun out across 10 12 episodes yeah because I know they were looking at um Katie Sackhoff um from Battlestar right to play the machine I believe for the tv show initially um but this has like a strong tv cast as well a lot of the actors in it have done tv shows um so vincent who's played by toby stevens he's in lost in space the new netflix show Uh, so he's in that one and um katie lotz is in dc's legends of tomorrow so she plays um sarah lance who is white canary in that 
She's from Arrow, right? Yeah, so she's an Arrow and then she goes on to Legend okay. of Tomorrow afterwards. You're more clued yeah, up on these I things. Yeah, I am like the comic book guy, <laughs> all this kind of shit. I knew she was Black Canary, I, I assumed that was an Arrow character. Yeah, it, it changes. I'm not going to go into it too much, but yeah, something happens, then someone else takes the mantle. Sure. Um, but yeah, so they, they've got a strong cast of TV actors, really. Yep. Uh, also, the guy who plays sort of the big baddie, uh, Dennis Lawson, who plays Thompson. Did you recognize him? No. He plays Wedge in Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I only know because I double checked it after. I was like, why do I know this guy? Oh, yeah. No, of course. Yeah. yeah I recognize him. It's bloody He's Wedge. got that thin face. Yeah. Sort of long, thin face, isn't it? Yeah. He's got one of those faces where you instantly recognize him. And he's done mm. lots of TV work over here. Obviously, he's a British actor. But yeah, Wedge is probably the thing that he's most well known for doing. Well, yeah, if you're in a Star Wars film, then <laughs> yeah, you can that's be your known. thing. <laughs> it's like when the um, the guy who was in Rizzle Kicks is in um, uh, Rogue One. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> Which one of Rizzle Kicks? <laughs> the taller one or the shorter one? The taller one? What, who's he playing in Rogue One? He's the guy, he's in the group of rebels on the um, in the sort of base at the end. The big fight? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so it's Jordan Stevens who's Rizzle out of Rizzle Kicks. Is one of them called Rizzle and one of them called Kicks? Yeah, so Jordan's Rizzle. I didn't know. And then, well, at least that's what it's saying according to Wikipedia. I like him. They're, yeah. they're the cheeky chappies, aren't they? So we haven't covered a lot of the plot, and I think with both of these films, there we'd never heard of them before, uh, before we were looking at films to include in the podcast, and I think we have to assume that a lot of people listening might not have heard of them. Maybe you've watched it already, but we should summarise this quite complicated plot shouldn't we uh the main character vincent is uh, an ai super genius he's a like world leading scientist because of the political circumstances that we talked about he's working for the ministry of defense ministry yeah like he's working yeah. for the military he's working basically. for the military isn't he um helping them create that war winning ai but he's got his own agenda which is he's got a very ill daughter she has a very rare uh, neurological disease and he thinks that ai might be the 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 trick to to curing that for her so he's funneling that government money into what government wants but also you know doing his own thing uh he recruits ava katie lots she's an up-and-coming uh graduate student type person who's developed this incredible ai what what was the deal with because they they brought they they moved past that quite quickly in the early stage of the film don't they but there's some interesting stuff going on there yeah, they do a lot of um, tests and things like that to try and figure out if these AI are intelligent enough and if they're sentient. Yeah. Um, so they go through a few different tests. But another of the themes in the film is sort of communication. And that comes a lot. And we'll go into that a bit in a bit more detail later on. Um, but the fact that his daughter has uh, Rett syndrome. Now, that syndrome is a... I'm reading Wikipedia here. <laughs> so it's a genetic brain disorder that typically becomes apparent after 6 to 18 months of age in females. Symptoms include problems with language, coordination, and repetitive movements. Right. And that, for me, has like an instant sort of symmetry with the way they depict machines and sort of the communication elements in that, and sort of the movement element. We talked a lot about the movement of robots and machines, haven't yeah. we? And it ties up quite well with the reason that he's involved in these uh, experiments and what his personal stake in it is, is that he, if he can solve the puzzle of communication problems in artificial intelligence and robots, uh, then he might be solving a problem for, for people with Rett syndrome. Yeah, so in these initial tests, he's trying to... That's, that's his end goal, but he's trying to find out if these artificial intelligence can help him in that quest. So what, what are the tests they do? They do a couple of tests, they? do. They? The main one is a Turing test, um, where I really like the way that that was presented. They have these giant kind of wall-sized panels of different colours, um, and he sits there in a chair in front of them. And I assume uh, the way the test is set up is one of them is voiced by a computer... So it's like an open call to grad students, isn't it? Are you good enough to, to work for the military? Yeah. They say um, they're going to give a grant to yeah. whoever has the best one. So the way they do the Turing test is, it's the traditional Turing test, which is, uh, well, no, the Turing test is just looking to see if a, if an artificial artificially intelligent computer can um, sufficiently f fool a human through interaction into thinking they're talking to another human. Mm. 
Um, so the way they do it is two panels, uh, one's voiced, both have computerized voices, but one of them is operated by a computer who, who is bidding for the grant. And I assume the other one would be operated by a human. And he's just asking a series of fairly random but nuanced questions and gauging the response. And it was very good scenes. Two scenes they did with that Turing test that were really good at the start. Of this and film. they color coded, don't they? So mm. they've got, so he asks questions to either sort of green or red. I can't remember exactly what the colors are, mm. but the colors are different depending on whose machine it is. Well, they use different colors each time, but yeah. 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 And I really like that. And that kind of motif went on throughout the film throughout the first half they use the color red a lot so in the other test um when vincent is uh, talking to a uh, soldier who's had a brain injury it goes red when there's sort of like the panic mm. um because basically what they do with that other soldier is they're doing another test uh which is the false belief test or it's based on something similar so that's the one where they've got a um, ball and a cup and they're doing that in this in this test and both these both this and the turing test are testing humanity and empathy this one's testing empathy more so the, the ball under the cup is uh vincent's assistant places a ball under cup a leaves the room vincent moves the ball to cup b the assistant comes back in and he asks the soldier who's had an ai implant to reconstruct his brain after an injury he asks him which cup would she look under to find the ball um and he says b it's an objective fact it's under b why wouldn't she look under b and it's the empathy of not being able to understand the world through someone else's eyes which i think is something that they also that's obviously like a fully grown man having that conversation but that's something they look at in children's development isn't it yeah because it's a um it's a test to test autism isn't it to see sort of like the spectrum of the disorder yeah so yeah, for him to be using that on someone who's got a brain implant to see how they're sort of dealing with the world, it's it's an, it's a really interesting concept, isn't it, it? It is an interesting concept, and I think that link to the way they measure children's development is important for this film because there's themes about children, his daughter, and the relationship that he's going to have with the main AI character later in the film, the machine, um, is all about sort of a childlike sense of development yeah the whole theme of sort of growth and families and the sort of um, different groupings that are in this film is very important and they sort of develop this as it goes on as the ai's become more prominent and we find out more about what's actually going on um with the machine and these um other soldiers which are also included in this ai development yeah so that soldier with the head implant which is the opening scene of the film that's that introduces the very important subplot uh, throughout the film, which is that in this underground facility, uh, most of the staff or like half of the sort of security side of the staff are these reconstructed soldiers who've had fatal or near fatal injuries. And the technologies that they're developing are ex experimented on, tested on them to, to kind of bring them back to life. But it has this weird side effect where they completely lose the power of speech after like a week or something. Yeah. It? And nobody knows why this happens. Mm. But as the film goes on, you hear this weird sound and you're not 100% sure if they're communicating with each other in this weird way. First, it sounds like it's like a weird static kind of sound, isn't it? Yeah. And because the film had explicitly said they lose the power of speech, when I was first hearing that, I thought that that was just the sound they make when they try to speak, but it's not speech. Um, but as the film goes on, and this is one of the things that I thought was a bit underdeveloped and would work quite well across a few episodes of a TV series, is that that subplot is incredibly important to everything that happens in the back half of the film. It's very unclear what's going on. It, it doesn't have a lot of time to breathe in the first half. Um, so those cyborg soldiers are all communicating with each other and they have this plot that we don't really understand until the end of the film and, and maybe not even then yeah they've got their own agenda they're communicating in secret um and they're hiding it from the humans and it reminded me of the like the facebook bot thing which we've talked about in a previous episode where the ai yeah. were communicating with each other and they were talking this weird language that we couldn't understand so immediately when this happened these um facebook bots were shut down yeah 
So that's part of the reason that the military don't find out about this communication, I think, until later on in the film. Because because they would be incredibly they, threatened. Yeah, they'd yeah. be shut down because yeah. they would feel that they're out of the loop and they would consider it hostile in some way. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, that the way that they're talking, apparently it's a combination of Persian and Farsi, okay. Iranian sort of like language. Okay. And that comes with the um, that comes from the actress who plays um, Suri, who is also the wife of um, the director. Oh, right. Apparently, this is what I've read. I'm not 100 on this, but this is what I'm <laughs> what I've read. And she's of that heritage. That's yeah. interesting. I did wonder if they were using. I did wonder how they'd constructed that. If it was just noises. I mean, that would certainly ruin the film slightly if you were Iranian. <laughs> and you could yeah, understand if you what could understand saying. Farsi, I yeah. think, yeah. I'd be, I'd be interested to find out if, if anybody's listening who does understand Farsi and does end up watching the film, I'd be really interested to find out how much of it is audible, how mm. much of the language that they're talking you can make out and what, what they're kind of saying. Yeah. Blue, how does war make you feel? Scared for myself and my family. Orange, tell me you're a machine and I'll believe that you're human. I'm not. Tell me that you are, you'll pass the test. I'm not a machine, you're not making sense. Orange, which smells better? A hospital corridor or a donkey's ass? Donkey ass? What? Can you repeat that? Blue. I'll take the corridor. Donkey ass? You're not making any sense at all. I'm not a machine. Henning, you better he return to your error. computer. He made an error. How do you know which one is my Can computer? Can you repeat that? I'm not a machine. So, Vincent is working with this other doctor, or this other engineer, scientist kind of person to start off with, who is played by Katie Lotz, and her name is Ava. They begin having a sort of, it's an almost romantic relationship, isn't it? It's yeah, sort of a bordering bit of a, on it. Yeah. Because in the synopsis of this, they kind of really pump that up, and they say, two scientists fall in love. But I don't really feel like that right. happens, yeah. It's kind of like they have a strong connection, yeah. but I feel like it doesn't really get developed. And then that kind of gets a bit twisted with what happens because... Well, the film takes a massive left turn, mm. which I wasn't expecting at all, even though I'd seen the trailer and seen the marketing. Because Katie Lotz's makeup in the rest of the film is so good, I didn't realise it was the same actress until it was actually playing out on screen. Yeah, um, She's killed. She's killed by... Uh, Chinese forces, although it's made quite clear that Vincent's boss, Thompson, it, Thompson, uh, it, the military guy, has orchestrated that to get rid of her, I guess, because she's a bit too free thinking and not following the the party line. Yeah, she's looking at all the computers and she's trying to find out about this um, weird part of the building. I can't remember what section it is. They say section six. Section six, yeah. Yeah. Which is where the soldiers are held before they're you know reconstituted into cyborg guys yeah so she's close to sort of stumbling upon all of that yeah um so he has her killed uh and in his grief vincent kind of kicks up the project gear and uh creates a, a full uh ai robot with um ava's ava's homemade super ai as the brain plus the mapping of her brain that he's done as part of their research to sort of add the personality a little bit and plus her physical appearance as well so the face looks like ava that's it and um it's got a lot of um similarities to as we said earlier mary shelley and frankenstein yeah and metropolis so this really reminds me of sort of the machine man maria and you see that coming through, don't you? You see that the most when uh, the machine is first born and it's kind of lowered down. It's quite it's quite grisly, it's quite grim. Um, but the, the body's kind of lowered down and it fills with blood. But it's got a Maria from Metropolis-ness to it. Uh, and then the filling with blood kind of feels a bit more Frankenstein-y because it's a bit biological and a bit yeah, gross. Yeah, I really, I really like that as an element yeah, because cool. I wasn't expecting it as well because... If you compare it to something like Ghost in the Shell, it's very much, it's more synthetic in a lot of ways. Whereas this seems very sort of body horror-ish almost. Mm. It verges on that at points. Yeah, definitely. And later on, there's some 
uh, some brain operation stuff that's very good and yeah. very traumatic. And it does kind of have little horror elements in here, doesn't it? Because there's a few kills in here which are very brutal. Um, later on, uh, Ava kills someone. Uh, which is she's sort of like driven to do by Thompson. Yeah, Thompson's trying to turn her into uh, the uh, a super weapon, basically, which, you know, to be fair, was what he was always trying to do. Yeah. He's actually sticking to his job, even though he's a bit of a, he's a bit ruthless. Um, but he's trying to turn a, to, not Ava, she's called Machine from this point on, yeah. isn't she? And she makes that very clear as well. So yeah, yeah. her sentience is very prominent. She says, um, like when she first wakes up, she says, Oh, I'm scared of the void. Mm, that's good. Of being, of not being alive. And she was happy when her, she opened her eyes. Yeah. And what was your first memory? My mother's face. Uh, what did your mother look like? She looked like me. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's similar to sort of like how we think about our parents because we have like a similar genetic traits. Yeah. Sort of like. And, and also looks. immediately sets her up as seeing herself as a wholly separate entity from Ava. She is not ava reborn into a, a, a metal body or whatever yeah so she's clearly defining herself as a person mm. as this separate entity and later on she declares i'm not ava i'm me yeah and it's very important that isn't it because it's not necessarily kind of like a you would expect him to sort of like try and uh, get ava back by making this machine like her but no he's still going about trying to create this other artificial intelligence and the film is constantly trying to tell you look it may look like ava but it's not it's this new thing this new species yeah so do you think that vincent how do you think vincent sees her because they they develop they definitely develop an emotional connection um and like i was saying earlier it's a it's a father and daughter connection roughly although it gets a bit weirder than that but that's sort of roughly the relationship that they build up. She she obviously has strong emotions towards him. He has strong emotions towards her, but like, what is he seeing there? Do you think he is seeing a distinct entity or is he still seeing Ava? Mm, I think obviously part of him is still seeing Ava because it is like, for all appearances sake, it's Ava. It looks just like her. But I think as their relationship grows, he is kind of playing out his own... He, he wants to be a dad to his daughter who is dealing with this syndrome and she can't communicate with him. So he's kind of living that life through Ava in a lot of ways because he's trying to teach her stuff and he's sort of getting all those sort of maternal things from it. Yeah. But it's, it's a little bit twisted because obviously he had that rom romantic, almost romantic relationship with the doctor. Yeah. So it's it's very hard to sort of digest. Yeah, but it doesn't, um, uh, as a film, it doesn't make a mess of that, I don't think. No, it keeps it quite clear, doesn't it? Well, I think that I think that the the director is is aware of the weirdness of that tension, so it never loses sight of the the difficulties of that the tension that's been created, and it works well within that rather than falling into he's fallen in love with his daughter because we've forgotten that there are other relationships at stake that everything's held in view um and it makes sure that if it feels weird it's supposed to feel weird and everyone knows that it feels weird yeah and that's and that same thing comes through with the other soldiers because you've got this like weirdness of the way they look and the sort of like frankenstein creationness of them mm it's this everything's a little bit twisted isn't it which is but like you said it's very aware of these things and one of the things which i picked up on as well so going back to um something which i caught in irobot you know in irobot how they're going on about um detective spooner is talking about how robots can't appreciate poetry or they can't write a symphony they can't appreciate those kind of things Yet in this, Ava is dancing to the music and she wants to hear music. Yeah. So they're making a point of saying in a lot of like even in AI as well, when the uh, the future AIs come down and are trying to find out about the history of humans, they want to know about these things. They want to know about poetry and sort of like love and their art and that what they were creating. 
it's a distinction between Ava and Machine. Machine wants the music and, and the dancing, uh, but we don't we don't really see. I don't think we see any of that from from Ava in the first half of the film. No, she's yeah. not set up as a character that likes to dance and likes to listen to music, whether she is or not. It's you know it's not part of the movie. Um, so again, it's that distinction. You know, we've it's a shorthand. We've seen it before. We saw it in AI, like you just said. Uh, they use it in Bicentennial Man as shorthand for um, he's he's something more than than a mere machine because he's sitting there appreciating music on his own. Um, and yeah, they're doing it here. What's really cool in this film is that those dance sequences are put on as a bit of spectacle and it's a really great, creepy, eerie scene where she's just sort of dancing around and they, they play it up in the trailer a lot, don't they? Yeah. Um, to, to kind of create this sense of like foreboding <laughs> and she like lights up doesn't she which yeah. i really liked and it's it's eerie it's you don't quite know what to make of it it yeah this whole film makes you feel a bit like that doesn't it and again looking at like low budget indie films that make make a lot out of what they've got i think that's katie lots background isn't it she's like a professional ballet dancer or you know trained dancer um I think that's that's an example of where you've got your plot, you know what you're doing, but then you cast someone who's a really talented classical dancer and then maybe after you've got your script and your plot, you think, wouldn't it be interesting if this machine was really into ballet? Yeah. So I, I wonder if that idea came after the the original, you know, plotting. Yeah, that's an interesting one because it, it feels like such a fundamental part of it, at least it does for me that fact that she's appreciating that but it is like the spectacle of it as well yeah yeah it plays out for a lot longer than it needs to for the for expressing that thing about her appreciation of art it's definitely a, a tonal thing as well and i it, it just made me think of like if i was making a low budget movie and i cast this actress and then i found out she was like a really talented dancer uh i'd probably try and come up with a way of having a dance sequence in the film you know yeah i mean that would make sense you want to take a make a make the most of it yeah take advantage of it yeah so the hostile takeover idea in this it seems like they're almost pushed to it a little bit by thompson because so thompson really wants the machine to be this angel of death i think he directly says he wants an angel of death says it a couple of times yeah, yeah. whereas vincent uh makes her human because he wants a machine which can save lives it can save human lives specifically and it can neg negotiate with other humans. So giving it a human face and a human body is important in that respect because without it, other humans wouldn't relate to her. Yeah. Yet Thompson is looking at more from the infiltration element because a human-looking robot can infiltrate China and then take out the, um, the whoever's in charge. And that's something that the machine comes up with previously. Yeah, when the, when, when the machine, before it's in a body first kind of fully comes online they ask it a series of questions and one of them is how do we defeat china i think yeah and it comes up with it straight away yeah it's, it's just got one sort of flawless scenario send in an infiltrator assassinate the leader done yeah and thompson's like latched onto this yeah. he's like okay brilliant that's what we're gonna do i think it that's immediately before he has ava killed isn't it because once he's got this ai that has solved the puzzle he no longer needs her yeah he's just like right get rid on to the next thing yeah and he's taking full advantage of the fact the machine is childlike as well because he kind of bullies her into killing this guy who he says killed her mother yeah. killed ava yeah. and i found that really intense that whole scene where yeah. he's like pushing her he says to her how are you going to stop him yeah he, he he walks her to the conclusion because she's she's resisting against it he says how are you going to stop him and her first thought is i'll scream at him yeah and, and she does this terrible, <laughs> yeah. this terrible electronic scream comes from her mouth yeah you th it's very childlike her suggestion um but then when she acts it out it is it's horrifying it's yeah. very it, it is scary and it would stop you in your tracks <laughs> um but thompson's like no no that's that's not gonna do it 
uh how can you stop him and then and then does she she comes to the conclusion i, I would kill him or i, I think would... she he keeps pushing her yeah. until he eventually she eventually kills him but she's already killed someone else previously yes yeah, she kills someone she kills a clown yeah they're doing the, they're doing really cruel torturous tests on her when she first comes online in that body they including could. a weird scene where they, they put a tarantula in a tube in front of her face and the dialogue is really weird there. they say something like girls are genetically programmed to be afraid of spiders yeah. boys aren't maybe it's that yeah and then they go into why she's a she yeah but and where have they got that line why have they put that line in about girls being genetically I predisposed to being scared of spiders so weird um but yeah they're doing all these weird like torture experiments on her one of them is a, a guy in a clown mask sneaks up on her and screams at her and she accidentally what stabs him in the temple with her yeah, finger. Yeah, with her finger. Yeah. And she says, Oh, I didn't know there was a difference between clowns and humans. Yeah. So she she's still learning at this point. She doesn't yeah. understand these things. There's just a terrifying clown, which she might have some sort of memory about clowns because she knows what a clown is. Yeah. So she's been programmed to have that idea. And I don't know if that's part of Ava's brain coming through because they copied Ava's brain to make this machine to an extent yeah there's the sort of overlay of her brain uh download that they've done on her yeah and it's kind of um copying and overwriting theme which we've seen in robocop yeah the synchronization yeah Um, so this is that that really comes through in this as well but she doesn't uh she doesn't kill that uh chinese militant guy who thompson says killed her mother does she she breaks his arm or breaks his leg in, in a really violent way like snaps the bone out of the mm. skin uh and she's just like well he won't hurt anyone now uh but thompson still still pushes her further and further to the point where she she cuts his throat i think yeah and then it's really the blood sort of splatters on her face doesn't mm-hmm. it yeah so thompson's leading her down this path of violence uh and then what happens with the what happens with the cyborgs more more broadly so the, in the meantime, there's this weird thing where we're seeing these sort of cyborgs communicating and there seems to be something going on. And initially you think that um, that they're... So Suri, who's the assistant to Thompson, you think that she's on Thompson's side. But there's a moment where Suri is talking to the machine and the machine talks back mm. in the same language. And then you're sort of seeing this this grouping of them and the machine that's quite late in the film and it was the first point where it's really suddenly very explicit that that is a solid form of communication something mysterious is going on it's not just a an attempt at communication that is a language and it's a big twist as well that suddenly everything kind of clicks into place with what these or who the cyborgs are actually aligned to and uh, where machine fits into that um pattern yeah, and the and Thompson says a really good line as well. He says, um, the most technologically advanced tribe is the one which will win. And that's very fitting for this because... Oh, I missed that line, but yeah, yeah that's really because good. Because Britain's in this war with China and whoever creates AI is going to be the winner in their eyes. Yeah, they think that one of those two countries will be the most technologically advanced tribe but no it's the ai itself which (laughs) which is the most technologically advanced yeah that's great it just sneaks up on them yeah and the tribe idea i really liked as well because there's sort of there's britain there's china there's humans there's ai there's these cyborgs which are part of the ai race yeah but the cyborgs feel so different to to machines the cyborgs are uh post-human right Mm. they they're reconstructed soldiers who've been injured and they've had a load of ai technology pumped into them like the guy with the arms and stuff like that it's very very much like upgrade isn't it yeah Uh, and they saw themselves as their own post-human race didn't they but they get overwritten don't they almost yeah because these implants are changing them in some way to the point where they can't talk it seems like they can't talk like humans anymore because they've almost evolved into this new sort of species yeah i keep calling it i keep referring to ai as a species or a race would you agree with those sort of like species is a better word i've been i've been using both as well but i think species is a more interesting way of looking at it because um because if you look at 
it's most interesting to look at it from an evolutionary point of view, especially when it's this synchronized human AI high hybrid thing that we've seen a few times. Mm. Um, if you look at it from an evolutionary sense, as evolution continues, new species are born. Is that right? We're a different species to the apes that we evolved from. Yeah. So if evolution takes a significant enough, you know, diversion and there's enough difference between two stages of that evolutionary process you've got a new species born haven't you yeah so i think certainly in this film um and we've seen films that uh use it to really look at um very present day racial themes where race might be a more appropriate way of looking at it a, a more appropriate lens on it but in this film and other films where we're talking about evolutionary ideas it's like there are another species that's a few steps ahead of us yeah that makes sense definitely what are you really? How do I know that you're alive and not just a clever imitation of life? How do you know if Thompson is alive? Or your daughter? What makes my clever imitation of life any different from theirs? They're human. They are alive. But how do you know that? You can't see their thoughts. Apart from their flesh, what makes them any different from me? So Thompson's very threatened by Machine, and he insists that Machine has to be shut down, um, and basically twists Vincent's arm and convinces him to go through with it. Uh, and it leads to that brain operation scene that I mentioned earlier. And that was, uh, for my money, the best scene in the film. Yeah, it was really good. Did you get... Um... Uh, flashbacks of the auto automata bit where they were doing the um autopsy there yeah a little bit what i got the most kind of flashbacks for was uh, when hal's having his brain removed yeah but it's course. a much more um obviously they bring a lot of emotion out of hal when that's happening even through his monotone voice this is a really emotional performance by katie lott she's having surgery on her brain and she's saying all kinds of things like stop please stop i'm afraid i'm me uh, i can feel my brain slipping away it's really it's upsetting to watch and it's just a tight close-up on her face for most of it and a few sort of stabbing shots of like her clenching her fist and, and stuff like that and a bit of the the bloody oily stuff yeah. that's in her body kind of coming out and what it looks like is vincent's taking out a tiny little speck which is supposed to be her soul. It turns out it's a GPS. <laughs> yeah. But at that point, I really liked the idea that it was just like her soul is such a tiny, fragile thing. Well, I like the idea that it turns out that it isn't because the soul should be something intangible and non-physical. Yeah. So I like the idea that it isn't, you know, this, these evolved new species beings uh that are insisting that they're not a machine they are alive it wouldn't be right that there was a small part in them that if you take it out they are no longer a sentient being because they're so powerful as well yeah like um because with the bit where um he's taking out that gps from her brain it made me think of the bit earlier when you had the guy with the um the arm uh prosthetics and he grabs a marble and then he crushes that marble mm. And it's something about the fragility of things because everything's quite, it's potentially quite fragile, but really these machines are stronger than you think they are. Yeah. And they're so strong, in fact, that they eventually take over. But it's not a, it's not necessarily a hostile takeover. It's, they're kind of pushed to this hostility, it feels like. Well, what's interesting is that because we never get the the full lowdown on what those cyborgs have been talking about and what they've been plotting, if they've been plotting the whole time, um, Machine just acts out of uh, revenge and self-defense and self-preservation. Thompson's trying to shut her down and have her destroyed. Vincent helps her by removing her GPS, which gives her freedom to move around, go on a rampage. She sets all of the cyborgs free and they immediately align with her. So I think there is a bubbling hostile takeover and it's these resentful, unhappy cyborgs who are kept prisoner, even though they are now a super advanced new species, but they're contained in this facility. 
and they're waiting for this tipping point of someone to come and set them free and let them overthrow their oppressors and get out. And they've got a sense of empathy as well, haven't they? Because uh, one of the other plot points that happens is Vincent copies his daughter's brain. So his daughter dies from this syndrome that she has. And Thompson is holding this copy of her brain over him to try and get him to do what he wants. Yeah. But Vincent goes against that to save the machine. And the machine remembers that. Yeah. And says, because you saved me, I'm going to save you and your daughter Mm. and then vincent says you're going to be more important to my girl growing up than i will because he knows that the copy of his daughter's brain is an ai so for him the next generation will be artificial intelligence and it will be like a species like her his daughter yeah yeah you've got these you've got three different types of ai at play at least three in this film right you've got uh you've got machine which is the main character she's a little bit reminiscent of the major from ghost in the shell she's a combination of a human brain scan with a super advanced uh ai computer in a brand new hyper technological body she's childlike she's a newborn creature in the world uh you've got these post-human um cyborgs who are like the upgraded in upgrade but they've also diverged into their own thing through this unique form of communication and then right at the end they throw in the daughter who's now existing in in just like a a virtual realm yeah it's like a um transparent ipad kind of thing where she's just a disembodied hologram almost a kind of like cgi creation it's like the phantom zone from uh, <laughs> superman like superman 2 she's stuck in like a phantom zone yeah. yeah but she's uh she's playing uh she's playing like a game with vincent at the end and it's quite sad because she then says she doesn't want to play with him anymore she wants to play with her mum which she sees as machine yeah it's a it's a weird ending and you know you've already got two interesting forms of ai uh with an interesting tension between them throughout the film and then they throw in a third one it's it is a good example of why some critics might say there's a there's a bit too much going on yeah. in here. But it's interesting and it's cool. But again, it's that kind of um, the generations and they're yeah. passing stuff oh, yeah. down. So you've got the family with Vincent and his daughter at the beginning and then him and Ava create the machine. And then the machine is having a family at the end with Vincent, which is a bit weird, um, and Vincent's new daughter. So again, this this idea of families and tribes and different groupings is very interesting in this film. And I also like the fact that this final scene, it's the sunset, which they've been going on about. Mm. And it's kind of like the sun setting on humanity mm. because, yeah, that's it for us, really. You can see what's, what's going to happen. The AI are going to be the sort of ones in charge and we're going to have to take a step down, which is kind of what they were saying in Automata as well. Yeah, yeah the and we've got the same sort of scenario while well, it's a different scenario because in automata it's kind of a natural destruction uh sort of extinction event this one it's uh well actually no the 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 robot at the end of automata does say you're you're gonna wipe yourself out wipe yourselves out and we're gonna let you do it yeah um which i guess is a potential scenario that could happen after the end of the machine isn't it yeah exactly it's sort of like who's gonna take over next so in this we're seeing humanity is actually quite fragile where we've we've talked about it before we could sort of wipe ourselves out at any point really because we make mistakes and there's lots of problems with us as a species yeah, it's the most likely uh, end yeah. of the world scenario that's, yeah. that's what they're kind of saying in a lot of these and yeah. it's like it's a warning it's pointing out our problems our failings And I think, again, good sci-fi films are pointing out where we go wrong so we can hopefully go right. Yeah. So in this, humans are fragile, machines are not. And our next film definitely shows that. Yep. So Kill Command from 2016, that's our next film this week, isn't it? It is indeed. What are they? They're called SAR. Study, Analyze, Reprogram. Learn. Like us. Identify 
So Kill Command from 2016, written and directed by Stephen Gomez. What did you think of Kill Command? I thought this was a a little bit of a simpler ride. <laughs> Just a little machine. bit simpler than Machine. Um, it's it's a nice, tight, fun action romp, I guess yeah. would be the word, right? It's got um, echoes of Predator and Dog Soldiers, uh, those kind of small group of characters stuck in the woods fighting some bad guys. That's it. It's very much a simple plot and it's a sci-fi action horror would you say that yeah yeah i think it's got all of those elements in there and it's it's very different to the machine isn't it? like we said it's not it, it tries to make a few interesting points but i think the main thing with this is you're just in it for the ride yeah um i mean as i was watching it i was actually feeling like there's very little plot in this film there's more to it than i was giving it credit for at the time but like it it's very um you can pay very little attention to this film and get what's going on in it and again it's because it's a well-made low budget sci-fi film um it does have a plot going on there is a storyline happening um but they're doing a lot with some i would say quite cheap special effects but they've Mm. obviously spent all the money they had on some very cool special effects to design these robots yeah well steven gomez is a was a vfx right um guy so he was all he was always going to be great at the visual effects aspect of this um so all of the um the machines in this the uh the sort of backdrops and things like that it's it's all down to him i would assume yeah they're very cool um yeah. they it's look very like, believable isn't it it's very believable uh they look like um transformers and i mean that in a good way in that when you see those transformers films um oh, i've only seen one so i don't know what i'm talking about but um there's an incredible level of detail to the robots in those, yeah. isn't there? It's, you know, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars have been spent on making sure that if you catch sight of Optimus Prime's knuckle, you know, you can see all the bolts. Yeah. You know, there's. it feels like there's that level of detail on the robots in this film. Yeah, definitely. And it's it, it seems realistic. And I think when you compare it to iRobot, it's a whole different way of doing things because... In that, Sonny and the other um, robots in that are very... They seem a lot more CGI than the ones in this. Yeah. These ones, yeah, like I said, they seem believable. They've got, like, rust marks. They react to stuff. I really like the designs of these. Mm. They look like real, real real-world military tech. Yeah. Which is crucial to, to what they are in the film. Yeah, exactly. So, in a nutshell... The plot of this is there's a bunch of US Marines and they're supposed to be going on a training exercise on this mysterious island. Looks like a mysterious island, not 100% sure. It looks like the British countryside. (laughs) (laughs) A mysterious island, just like the British countryside. I mean, we're mysterious. It looks like the Royal Forest of (laughs) Dean. It's probably just. I don't know where it was shot, but it. I it think maybe like I gave a bit more credit there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's a big forest. <laughs> They're in a forest, which is not a mysterious island. At all. <laughs> They've got to hunt some AI. That's the training exercise. Yep. Training exercise goes wrong. The AI hunts them. Yes. Simple. That's about the whole plot, isn't it? That's all you need. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a good action movie within that, isn't it? And it's yeah. the, the idea that the AI hunts them is actually crucial to, to what it's trying to do with ai in this film isn't it because there's a turning of the tables which is the essential horror element of the Mm. film they arrive on the island um they've got this uh like science person with them mills yeah so mills is like a hybrid kind of ai character she's not strictly ai she's just got an implant she's got a cybernetic implant in her which allows her to walk just like an upgrade so she'd be paralyzed if she didn't have this implant. This becomes more significant as the film goes on because it allows her to converse with the robots. These, what are they called? They're called SAR. S-A-R, yeah. Yeah, and that stands for Study, Analyze, Reprogram. And what, so they're kind of evolving in this sort of program that, they've, that they're running. So, yeah. Yeah, they, they, at the start of the film, they go in, they're very cocky, uh, they just completely destroy a whole group of, of robots and and these robots seem really 
like stupid. But... Yeah, yeah, they're just sort of like guns on sticks and they've got some dummies on it, like a moving platform yeah. and they just completely destroy them. They get the, they take the high ground and just shoot them to ribbons. Wipe them out. But then in their next encounter, they get bamboozled by the robots and then the robots have suddenly taken the high ground. So the first thing they do is they have observed the Marines, learnt from them, copied them and bettered them. Yeah, so they've studied, analysed <laughs> and reprogrammed. Yeah. And there's a few different robots in this aren't there so there's different sort of categories of robot yeah the the sar that they're sort of stand separate don't they and i think mm. they're not supposed to be there is that right she's uh mills is kind of surprised when she first sees an sar yeah because they're very mysterious aren't they yeah so and the sar assuming well i'm guessing the sar has been making modifications to the other ones mm. because you've got these weird horse spider turret robot things which i really loved because yeah, they kind of cool. like gallop along like horses and because of the long turret it makes them look a bit mm. a bit like that um yet they've got these weird spidery legs and there's these drones which look like flying flowers <laughs> yeah yeah i was adding so much um so much imagination to the, yeah, no, that's a, it. it's a fair description though. yeah i thought the best way to describe this in a podcast so yeah so flying flower robots horse turret spider machines yeah and then the sar which is like got spider legs it looks a bit like um sir kill a lot from robot wars <laughs> yeah, yeah a bit yeah it's definitely more humanoid it's got a humanoid top half hasn't it yeah um and a kind of creepy humanoid but also insect like face I yeah guess. and it felt it felt like it had like serrated hands it's got like a blowtorch hand hasn't it's got it? a blowtorch hand like no circular lot didn't have it he had a <laughs> pincer yeah and yeah. a joust right that was it yeah um but yeah they've got a blowtorch uh kind of a circular saw thing that pops out it's all the it's all the robot wars greatest hits isn't yeah. it yeah that's it it's like it's a more sophisticated version of robot wars <laughs> but yeah so you've got these marine characters and the marines are very stereotypical there's yep. you see them in the so the intro sequence and all the exposition to what their characters are like is told during the journey in that helicarrier yeah if you can imagine six or seven tough guy marines <laughs> yes that's the characters from this film so you've got the rookie marine yeah you've got the um the sort of like the cold captain mm. who's got something else going on he's a bit dark and brooding <laughs> yeah you've got the the sort of renegade one who you don't you can't quite gauge but you know he's dangerous who is that they he's were all the guy that, the sniper <laughs> i mean they all pretty much fit that bill but the guy the sniper guy okay with the crazy eyes yep yeah which we'll go into in a bit because didn't they all have crazy eyes or was he the only one with the eye upgrades uh he's the only one that i noticed who had the eye upgrades right but they might have done they, they make a point of saying like you can switch them on or switch them off whereas mills can't because she's a cyborg basically yeah yeah yeah, so these these characters seem a bit disposable, don't they? Yeah. So you're going in and you're like, right, most of these guys are probably going to die hmm. in some horrendous way. And uh, they all do, right? Yeah. Who they survives? I can't remember. So, Just Mills and one other. Is it? So does the rookie guy survive? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The captain doesn't, does he? He cops it near the end, I think. Yeah, so a few of them survive at the end. Yeah, there's a number of cool action sequences where they get separated in various different inexplicable ways um so they can all be picked off one by one in cool violent death scenes there's some really good scenes where you kind of get glimpses of what the ai's been up to mm. i think quite early on in the film you see they stumble on like a whole glade of dead deer uh and the ai have been using the deer for target practice yeah which is horrible and like graphic you see all the deer corpses and and then you start thinking about why is ai doing target practice and like do we get a real explanation on that is it that um is it because they want to get better at shooting or is it because they've seen marines doing target practice and they're just imitating it it might be it's, it's probably a bit of both isn't it because they don't really clarify that but I quite like that because it's a bit mysterious. You don't quite know why they've been doing that. Yeah. But whatever they're doing, they're trying to get better at being what they are, which is killing machines. 
killing machines, but specifically there's a bit of a twist on that, isn't there? That um, they're not necessarily trying to be better killing machines. They're trying to be better killing training machines. Yeah. Was I getting that right? They, um, they're designed to train humans to be better hunter killers. And to do that, they have to be very good hunter killers themselves to force the Marines into a situation where they have to really respond very intelligently and very violently to win that fight. I mean, that would make sense. But I think towards the end, what they say is they, um, they're, they're specifically created the SARS uh, because they want to save human lives. So they can put these robots into the, into the field so they don't have to put the soldiers out there. So they're going to replace the Marines. And that, that sort of comes out towards the end. But initially, that's kind of what you think. You think these robots are there for the Marines, and it's the Marines who are supposed to be getting better. And that's what the Marines think as well. But then it sort of twists it towards the end. So the SAR says something to Mills, I think. The, there's a main SAR that can talk to her. Yeah. And it says something like, we're trying to make soldiers better. It says they require motivation, yeah. don't they? So they're trying to learn what they can from the Marines, but doing these basic training things aren't teaching them anything. Yeah, which is why they have to go a step beyond to evolve a little bit and give them more of a terrifying challenge, which yeah. gives them that motivation. And right? that's why you find out towards the end that the SAR robots have orchestrated this test. So yeah. they've got the Marines to come in because they want to learn more. They want to study, analyze, and reprogram. So they need more subjects in order to do that. So that's why these Marines are sent in. So the end goal of the SARS is to what? It's just, yeah. I mean, I don't <laughs> think they have any significant end goal. It's just they want to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah, so they've they've got a, they, they are sticking to their, the parameters of their programming. It's like Vicky in iRobot. Mm. They've got these uh, parameters that they have to work to. They've got a mission, um, but they've kind of separated themselves from, from humanity too much. And they followed it to a weird logical conclusion, which wasn't the intention. Yeah, and then if they've just got better at, killing haven't they a little bit more of a complicated plot than we gave it credit for i think yeah but the thing is you can <laughs> you can get all of that from it and you can just watch it and watch the marines get killed in hor horrendous ways yeah just, i think i just did that yeah, yeah and just shoot the crap out yeah of it's stuff. cool the guy gets right there if i can stop this wait Don't let it cut me up! Do it! No, wait! <laughs> the guns are really cool as well. Yeah, the guns are cool. It's got some cool guns. There's a, there's a great scene where one of them gets captured by a SAR and they all know what's going to happen to him. Uh... And he's, he's begging to be put out of his misery, isn't he? And yeah. uh, the captain does it in the end. The, the, he's asking the sniper to do it, isn't he? The sniper's got the shot on him. Yeah. And then the captain's the one who pulls the trigger in the end with his own gun. That's a horrible scene, but yeah. it was cool. But I really like the sniper character, specifically because the way he aims. Now, did you get video game sort yeah. of influences from this? Yeah, it, it, does, it does feel more like a video game in the terms that it's... Uh, in the sense that it's really cool looking... And the plot is not kind of the main thing about it. it. And you've got a lot of expendable characters who die in cool ways and big action sequences and characters get separated so they can face off with like a different kind of robot and get into a big fight that feels just like, you know, the different levels of a video yeah, game. Yeah, it reminded me of lots of shoot 'em ups I've played in the past. Yeah. And it's got that kind of, it's it's just fun and action orientated. Um, but with the, going back to the sniper, the way he was targeting, I found really interesting because they make a thing about his eye implants. And when during the final scene, when they're in the um, this weird test zone, which like is a made small to, town, right? yeah, it's like an urban environment, yeah. isn't it? And then he's firing at the robots, and then the robots start firing back. So he just puts his gun up, and he's not looking for the shot anymore. His eyes can see through the sight of the oh, gun, yeah. Yeah. and I found that 
just really cool basically. yeah it's cool that's the ability that you unlock towards the end of the game that allows you to <laughs> get more kills from a secure position so you can beat the big boss yeah 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 and again it, there was a big boss there is a there? big boss yeah they they trick him in the end don't they um they've got an emp classic mm -hmm. matrix uh robot killing device um but because she because mills is so upgraded and cyborgy the the emp could kill her or wipe her brain or something um so they use her as bait i think right? yeah kind of lure him in and then they well she uses herself as bait doesn't she yeah. she goes out to try and and then they do the mp and we've got that kind of they sow the seeds early on because she's she's using her implants to deactivate the sniper's gun at the mm. start of the film just to you know mess with him it's a bit of joshing in that yeah um but then she's got that gun set up and it's aimed at the SAR and she's able to remotely shoot it in the head. Yeah. Like all the remote stuff I found interesting. The the way that she's communicating with the SARS and there's this moment where she she gets like a zip file to her brain or something. Yeah, is that when she's uh, unconscious? Yeah, but before that, when she first sees the the SAR for the first time. And I think the moment when you first see that robot's quite good mm. because it's, it's, in the, not, it's in a tree, isn't it? It's in a tree and it's not facing and her. And it looks then, like it bleeds out of its face. Yeah, because it's, it's got cool. blood all over it. Oh, yeah. there's lots of bits like that where there's just robots covered in blood. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. Um, but yeah, she gets like a, she has like a, a moment of what, like recognition and realization and she, yeah. It's like she's being infected with a virus, right? Yeah. And that's key to kind of what happens at the end of the film, which is uh, it's kind of implied that she wakes up and the SAR is going to be operating through her. Yeah, that's it's sort of like that. Is she still her? Is she a SAR now? Yeah. That's sort of foreboding at the end. Yeah. She, it's, uh, again, a little bit similar to Ghost in the Shell where she's waking up as possibly a new thing that is possibly a huge threat to humanity, but we don't know. Yeah, and the virus aspect as well, that's something we didn't talk about with the machine. There's a moment where they talk about viruses are very uh, are a problem and the enemy could launch a virus into the soldiers. So this whole, the weakness for AI, we talked about the fragility of um, being human. For AI, it's, it's like techno viruses and things mm. like that. So you're seeing a little bit of that in both these films, just yeah. briefly, not too much. Yeah, and it's obviously the weakness for her as well. Well, it's a it's a two way street, isn't it? Because she has that moment of seeming like she's infected with a virus, but it is also kind of the way that she's able to to fight back against them, communicate with them, lure them into traps, and all of that, isn't it? Yes, yeah, that communication aspect, isn't it? Yeah. So I think with Kill Command, one of the big things is you've got robots without any sense of empathy. Yeah. And they're just, they're made for war and the machine in the machine is made for war as well. Yeah. But with a kind of rogue element of design where Vincent has, uh, has f forced in a kind of empath empathic element to her brain. Yeah. But, but in this, it's just, they're just purely killing machines. Yeah, and they've gone down this weird devolved route of violence through that lack of empathy. And it's sort of about what you're teaching these artificial intelligence. And in Kill Command, you're only teaching them how to kill, hence the name Kill Command. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas in the machine, Vincent is trying to teach um, the machine about sort of like life and you can't bully people and you've got to be sort of like nice and you've got to understand what other people are going through yeah he treats her like a daughter like a child yeah teaches her these life lessons that a living thing needs to be taught to, to function in society in kill command the machines are definitely machines they don't look human at all they're very far removed whereas in the machine i'm saying machine a lot <laughs> uh whereas in the machine they're made to look human and it's kind of this weird sort of which which route is it going to go down is it going to be we're going to make them look in our image or are we going to make them so different that we think of them complete in a completely different way yeah so, appearances are important um and they determine the way the audience is going to see them and that determines the way you're going to write your film 
Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, it makes me kind of reflect back on Automata, which had that weird, uh, very inhuman looking insect creature that they create, which is like one of the weirdest parts of the film, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a good reason that's weird. It's because it looks so strange and unnatural. Whereas uh, these two films take two straightforward routes to presenting your robot character. Does it look like us or is it an advanced killing machine that looks like a walking gun? Um, and that determines the perceptions of the characters, it determines the perceptions of the audience, and it determines the type of AI that you're going to have in your film. So next week we're taking uh, a complete left turn from this topic, aren't we? We've, we've looked at uh, robots completely threatening us and threatening to take over our world. Next week we're going to be looking at some robots falling in love. Yeah, on the flip side of things. Falling in love with each other falling in love with us i'm not sure because i haven't seen these two films yet um <laughs> the films are uncanny from 2015 and zoe from 2018 uh, they look like interesting movies with some interesting concepts and i'm looking forward to seeing them and talking about them so thank you very much for listening this week yes thank you very much for listening uh, remember if you have enjoyed the podcast uh please just let us know we're on twitter we've got a facebook page we're on instagram so if you want to find any of those it's at through sci-fi pod um, you can also email us at journey through sci-fi at gmail.com or we've got a website which is www.journey through sci-fi.com so yeah lots of different ways to get in touch uh, remember if you want to leave us a rating on itunes that helps us with the itunes algorithms so we can help get the word out and yeah we hope you're enjoying it yep that's all for this week thank you and goodbye mm-hmm.